Talk with Mitch LaFon. We are speaking with Lionheart's um, Rocky Newton. New album is The Reality of Miracles. Comes out in July, of course, 2020. <laughs> if you're watching this next year. Uh, Rocky, a great pleasure to have you. Bonjour. Yeah, great, great to be here. Good to talk to you, Mitch. Yeah, so uh, I do want to, you know, you do have a, a six degree of separation to Def Leppard, and I do want to get to that. But before that, I want to talk about Reality of Miracles. It is sort of the second album since you've decided to come back. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about, about this album, because I've had a chance to hear it, and it is just a, a melodic rock feast. It is, it is just fantastic. And you've got Shy's uh, former frontman there. Um, talk to me about this. Well, we're all really proud of the album. It, we, we all believe it's some of the best work any of us have ever done. And, we, you know, um, with the various members of the band, we do have quite a track record. Um, and basically, it's been written over the course of, a, of, of the last three years and actually recorded over that, that amount of time as well. Um, we, all the band members are involved in other projects. And so there's, a, there's always a lot going on. Um, so it's a matter of fitting in time and, and luckily with Steve Mann, who produces the album and is our guitar player, he, um, he has his own studio. Um, and so we've been doing it sort of as we went along and writing songs and tweaking them and, and everybody in, well, the four, four members of the band write. So there's, there's a real cross section of styles in there. And then we all get together. Somebody will come up with an idea. Lee will come up with a melody and some words, and then we, we kick it around and change it. And, uh, and it's just, we've had the luxury of the time to be able to, to get it just how we like it. And uh, and actually, we were struggling to get the album finished, and that's one of the the pluses to come out of the whole coronavirus thing was that we, you know, it actually didn't. It meant that we had time to finish the album because the way we record, Steve is in Germany, I'm in the UK, uh, the rest of the guys are scattered all different parts of the UK, and so we kind of we always record our our parts remotely anyway. So we were able to carry on doing that and were able to just focus on getting the job done and. They say we're we're all really really proud of it. So, yeah, and and, and you should be because it sounds great. But um, before I, I go I go further with the album, I do want to go back in time. Uh, the band is formed out of sort of bits and pieces of other bands from the new wave of British heavy metal. You've got Jess Cox of Tigers of Pantain that comes in for a little bit, didn't work out. Dennis, of course, of Iron Maiden. Frank Noon of Def Leppard. Uh, talk to me about the early days and, and getting these sort of different pieces in there and, and sort of forming a, a sort of new wave of British heavy metal supergroup. Yeah, well, the, the band came together when um, Frank and I, I mean, to go with Frank Noon and I, we've, we've known each other since elementary school, since we were five years old. Um, and so and we played together as a rhythm, a rhythm section through various um, bands, the next band, Wildfire. Um, and then what we were, we were kind of doing that, our own thing doing that. In the meantime, Dennis had left Iron Maiden. Jess Cox had left the Tigers of Pantang. They decided to get together and form a band. And they, it was literally just Dennis and Jess, a guitar player and a singer. And they needed they needed a band. They got Jess knew Steve because Steve had auditioned for Tigers of Pantang when John Sykes got the gig. Um, and then we were all down at the Marquee Club, the legendary Marquee Club in, in London one night where we used to hang out every night. And through a mutual friend, it introduced me and Frank to Dennis and Jess, who were down there. And they said, great, come down and have a jam. We, we had a jam and, and it all fell into place. And, and that was the the you know the the, the kind of uh, the start of the band um yeah uh, and a great start uh so let me just take you back uh, for that again uh jess didn't work out because he he comes from a very sort of punk sneery kind of attitude and the band definitely went more melodic rock uh talk to me about changing singers at that time and saying okay th this is not going to work with jess let's let us find somebody that will deliver this more sort of melodic uh, music that we're going to make. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, that was the issue with Jess. I mean, lovely guy and, and great at what he does. 
But we soon realized that that wasn't the direction that we wanted to take Lionheart in. And there's, you know, to do the kind of melodic stuff we do, Jesse's voice was completely wrong for it. You know, as you say, he's from a punk, more, I guess, heavy metal um, background. So we, you know, had to really kind of bite hard and go, okay, look, if we're going to do this right, we, we, yeah, we need to find somebody who, who can sing more in the style we wanted to. And then we proceeded to have, I think, two other singers in, um, and, and neither of them really worked out exactly how we wanted. And then we, our manager said, well, all of you guys can sing. So why do you actually even need a singer? And so for a couple of years, Dennis and I used to share the lead vocals and the, and the three of us always sang together, which was the, the Lionheart sound of the three part harmony vocals was was Steve, Dennis and me. And our, and our voices, while neither one of us was a particularly strong lead vocalist in our own right, there was something about the blend of our voices together and the natural ranges of our voices where you know, that the total was greater than the sum of the parts. And, and, we, and we, we did a lot of session work as three-part harmony vocals in the early 80s doing that. And as I say, and, and we gigged for a couple of years. We did the Reading Festival in the UK. Then, you know, it moved on to the next stage and we were looking for a major deal. Um, and we had a guy called Nigel Thomas who was managing Saxon at the time. He, he was out shopping for a deal for us. And, and he, we eventually signed with CBS in America, but I think they made it quite clear that they would like to see a singer with the band. And we always wanted a singer, we just didn't find the right one. And then, excuse me, and then we stumbled across Chad Brown, who had an amazing voice for what we wanted at the time. And so we snapped him up to uh, to go and record the our first album, the Hot Tonight album, which we did in, in LA in, in 84. Yeah, and, and I did want to ask you about that, and then I want to get back to some of the studio stuff. Uh, Hot Tonight, you head out to L.A., so you, you've got a, a, a British band, new wave of heavy metal, a new wave of British heavy metal, uh, and then you head out to L.A., where they have a tendency to sort of sugarcoat everything and sweeten it up and add a lot of keyboards and add all kinds, you know, Lynn drums, and they just, they're very un-rock and roll sometimes. Uh, was that a good decision to go out to L.A., or do you look back on it now and say, hey, maybe we should have done it at home and gotten a little bit more British sneer to it? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question, um, and we've debated this backwards and forwards. I mean, it's, you know, we, we had Kevin Beamish producing it, who'd just come off REO Speedwagon, um, uh, you know, and, and he was very much in that AOR style, which is how we wanted to go. We maybe took it a step too far with on the first song, instead of a guitar solo, there's a saxophone solo, you know, Foreigners 4 had just come out with Urgent. And we, we were kind of heavily influenced by that. And we thought this is the future. This is the way to go. Looking back on it now, I think we'd probably trade that for a guitar solo. Um, and there's various other bits and pieces. And it, it does sound very lush. It, the sound of that album is nothing like the sound of the first few gigs we did with Jess Cox. It was the direction we wanted to go into, but arguably it went a little too far in that direction. I don't know, but, you know, we, we've no complaints because, you know, it, it, it still is a good album. The, yeah, the production is very 1980s, but it was the 1980s, so it's a product of its time, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It sounds, it sounds exactly like it should have been. Uh, do you ever consider maybe, uh, as you're doing new albums, Update it, either do a live version or just throw it on as a couple of bonus tracks where you take some of those tracks from that first album and say, hey, let's give it to our new singer with the new band and let's make it 19, or not 19, haha, 2020. Well, we do, of course, do three or four songs from the Hot Tonight album live. And so they're, they're kind of updated from that point of view. And, and who knows, maybe at some point. You know, we'll, we'll do a live album. We did do something similar when we did um, the last album three years ago, Second Nature. We there, were, I think there were three, possibly four songs which um, weren't on the Hot Tonight album, but they were written at the same time, and we demoed and we updated those completely. So, uh, uh, you know, so yeah, we have done that. We have done that. All right, great. So let. Let us talk a little bit about these these six degrees of separation. You were, of course, in the next band with Frank Noon, and Frank did play on the first Def Leppard EP. 
Um, talk to me a little bit about that time. Were, were you around that Def Leppard camp quite a bit? Were you? Did you ever want to produce them or road manage them or or do anything with them? Or was Frank sort of on his own in Leopard and you didn't have much involvement at all at that time? Okay, so the the, the story is that um, we, the next band was me, Frank Noon, and John Lockton. We were a three-piece. I was playing bass and singing lead vocals. Frank was drumming. John played guitar. You know, John went on to play with Brian Robertson and Jimmy Bain in Wild Horses, and then later on with a German band called Victory. Um, then Frank... We were based in my hometown in Grantham in Lincolnshire, and, and we got to be a fairly big local band uh, around Grantham and Nottingham and, and, and in a kind of local area. But we pretty soon realised that if we wanted to take it a step further, we had to kind of either move to London or a bigger city or whatever. And it just so happened that a guy came to one of our gigs and saw us who ran uh, the biggest nightclub in Sheffield, a club called The Limit. And, uh, and he said, look, I want to manage you guys come and live in Sheffield, and he, there were rooms above his nightclub where we rehearsed all day, and then at night we would work in the club behind the bar, we would help the bands with their gear or whatever. And we are kind of 18 months, two years older than the Def Leppard guys, and they were just starting out. And so they kind of made themselves known to us and came and, and we just became friends, basically, all, all of us. And we used to go to their rehearsal room, they used to come and watch our rehearsals. And, um, and they were looking for a drummer to record their first EP, which they got, and Joe has freely acknowledged this on, on his radio show on Planet Rock in the UK, uh, where he, he name-checked us all, that they got the idea to do their um, their EP um, from the EP that we did with the next band. We told them the studio to use, where to get the album pressed, and we kind of had the template for it all. And uh, they wanted, they weren't happy with the, the drummer they had, and so basically they borrowed Frank from the next band to do the recording. Um, and uh, I think they, they probably asked Frank to join and Frank, you know, maybe in, in hind, with hindsight rather stupidly said no. But you have to understand that they were like a local band that were just starting and we had a bit more of a name. And when we used to play, Def Leppard used to open up for us, um, you know, which people find hard to believe, but that's just how it was. Um, you know, who was to know what was going to happen within the space of a couple of years? Their careers kind of took a very sharp trajectory, you know, so so fair play to them. But um, and so that's how we got to know them. And we were just friends. And then we moved to London. And and then shortly after that, uh, Joe and I think a couple of the other guys also moved to London and we all shared a house together. Uh, Joe was in the basement. Frank was on the ground floor. I was in the, on the first floor and it was like the musicians hangout place and so we we were just, we kept in touch we were all friends um yeah well, well uh, let me ask you this because you you put out four by three back in the day um yeah. you'd look at the music business now and we talked that it's really become a singles driven market what was the concept of doing an ep back then why not a full-length album because you know respectfully a full-length album was like 28 minutes back in the day you know it was it was eight songs yeah. um why the decision to make an EP? Because I find it interesting that you're making an EP and then you convince the guys, or maybe not convince the guys, but suggest to Def Leppard that they do an EP. Um, it seemed very 2020 back 40 years ago. I think there's two reasons. One is it was very fashionable to do that at the time. We remember, we were just coming out and running concurrently with the punk scene. And the punk scene were into singles and homemade records. You did your own. And both us and Def, the Def Leppard guys basically funded it ourselves. We went scrounging money off our parents and friends and whatever to raise the money. And four songs was about all we could afford to do. And then with the pressing costs of the album, and, and the idea was we would then sell them at gigs to, um, you know, to make the money back. So... I guess that's why, you know, it, it kind of had that punk homemade right. feel about it. Okay, so that, that, that makes sense then. Um, of course, uh, Pete uh, Willis was friends with, with Frank. And, and is that somebody you still talk to, the, to, to today? I mean, are you still, is Pete still around? Do you, do you ever reach out? I, I haven't spoken to Pete in, gosh, 30 years or more. So, so I, I have no idea what, what he's doing, to be honest. No. 
Wow. Yeah, he, he's really sort of vanished off the face of the earth. Okay, so so mm. we, we did say we were going to talk Def Leppard a bit. Um, you, you get the, the band goes and records uh, High and Dry, and then they make a switch. Phil Collin comes in, and they do Pyromania. You are credited on Pyromania, or at least fans now know that you sang backup vocals, at least on Rock of Ages, if not more. Uh, how did that come about? And and uh, Steve, who's in you, in the band with you, says very clearly that you have a very distinctive style, and he wouldn't be surprised if Mutt Lang borrowed from your style. <laughs> wow. Well, that's very flattering of him to say that. Uh, I w- of course, that's that's for him to say. I wouldn't possibly say that, but... Um, yeah, as to how that became, I say we, we'd um, we'd kept in touch with the Leopard guys, and in fact, um, when Def Leppard were touring the High and Dry album in the UK, Lionheart um, supported them. We opened up for, for them, so we, we'd kept in touch, and we were all sharing a house anyway, so it was all really close. And then I kind of moved out of the the, the communal house and lost touch for a year or so, and then in 1985, I believe it was. Um, Frank Noon got married and I went to the wedding and Joe Elliott was at the wedding and I got chatting to Joe and Joe said, oh, we're um, we're we're doing um, this. Actually, no, hang on. I'm, I'm getting my, my timeline mixed yeah, up. Yeah, you are, because Pyromania so, yeah. came out in 83. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this has yeah, got to be 80. To that, right. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Pyromania, that was, I think, when we were all still in the house together and, uh, and they were doing and I, I did just do Rock of Ages on that. They were doing it at Battery Studios in London, and they uh, they just wanted a, a gang effect on uh, you know on 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 the the backing vocals. And Joe asked me to come down, um, and I got there, and there was Terry Schless, uh, Terry Schlesser from the band Crawler. He was there. Um, um, uh, Pete Watts, over in Watts from Mott the Hoople, he was doing it. I was doing it, and Mutt Langer and various band members. So there was probably eight of us around the microphone. Or you know, just singing those big those big voices, and it, well, I was literally there for you know three hours or four hours in the afternoon, and did the one session on that. Um, yeah, so then that that came out, and then we kind of lost touch a bit, and then it was at Frank Noon's wedding in '85, in August '85, that Joe said we're over in Dublin doing the new album, which nobody knew was going to be called Hysteria at this point. He said, would you come over and, and, and do some, uh, some backing vocals for us? He, he explained that they, you know, they were, they were doing backing vocals and lead vocals at the same time. And he didn't want to kind of thrash his voice out doing backing vocals all day. He wanted to sing in the evening because that's when his voice was at the strongest and uh, and so basically i was kind of joe's sub during the day so he didn't have to sing backing vocals and so there was mutt me uh sav um rick and i think that was probably it um the four of us singing no um, no steve clark there he wasn't he occasionally wasn't... steve would but um he didn't have the strongest voice oh and and, and obviously phil yeah because no, phil's got a great stuff. voice i mean yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the stuff yeah, yeah. he does with man rays and the end and uh, delta deep Great yeah. boy. So, so let me just ask you about that because, okay, so 83 or 80, when was Pyromania recorded? 82? 83? Yeah. It came out in 83. Um, yeah. What, what's it like working with Mutt? Because Mutt has a very strong Canadian connection. He, of, of course, did stuff with Brian Adams. He does stuff with Shania yeah. Twain. Arguably, some will say that he helped give Shania Twain a, a career just because they, 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 they crafted such great music together. Um, so on Pyromania, you're there, like you said, for three hours, but do you notice anything in his approach to music making? Do you notice anything that the way the studio is set up, the, the instructions he gives you, the, the, the techniques, what's it like being with Mutt? Because he is sort of a, an unheralded genius. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was, and and it was an absolute honor and a privilege to watch him work. Of course, I was only there for vocal sessions. I wasn't there for the tracking of any of the instruments or anything else. But um, as an example of his attention to detail, that the first two days I was there, we sang one word, uh, which was women off, you know, women, <laughs> that song. We, I mean, we tracked it so many times. He would take a 24-track machine and there would be um, a rough mix of the backing track on two tracks and then we'd fill up the other, you know, 22 tracks, bounce them down, and fill up 20, bounce down, fill up 18, bounce, and 
going uh, and it was just relentless and uh, but he was convinced this was the only way to get a real authentic kind of football crowd effect which is which is what he wanted and uh, yeah so that's that was it i mean i was the first four days we we sang two words the first two days women the second two days men you know so uh, it was it was very uh, very strange but he was there was still quality control and everything we did yeah, that one wasn't quite right let's do it again you know Okay, well, let me let me ask you about that because you now are in a situation where you you're, you're you're tracking the word women for you know hours and hours. When you get to making your own records, when you get to Reality of Miracles, the the new Lionheart record, when you get to other records, do you take some of that and and say, hey, we need to be a little more uh, perfectionist in the way we approach things, or do you say, oh my God, no, just plug and play. Let's get it old school, like Black Sabbath on that first album. Let's get it done in a couple of weeks. Like, how, how do you sort of see it on your own person in terms of, of music making? Um, well, we, we like to get it right, but I, I think we concentrate on getting the parts absolutely right, pitch perfect and timing right, which is a challenge because we're recording remotely. Remember, in, in the old days, the three of us would sing around one microphone, whereas I'm doing my parts in my little home studio here. Dennis is doing his parts in, in, um, at a friend's studio. Steve is doing his parts in Germany. And so, you know, and we, we have to try and, and sync up and, and, and get it just right. And so, but we don't layer and layer the parts. We'll, we'll, may, I'll sing my part four times. And Dennis four times, Steve four times. So there's a stereo pair each, which is just double tracked, you know. So, but so we, we're going for quality rather than quantity, which makes sense. Now, part of the of the Def Leppard recording uh, history includes Mike Shipley, uh, who unfortunately passed away in 2013. Did you have a chance to meet Mike? Because I think you know we we credit Mutt quite a bit. But I think sometimes we forget Mike in the equation. I think he was very, very uh, important to what was going on. Um, any memories of Mike, Sh uh, Mike Shipley? To the best of my memory, I don't think I ever met Mike. Um, the engineer was a guy called Nigel Green. Um, when I was, um, we did all the backing vocals at Windmill Lane Studios in, in Dublin, in Ireland. Um, and it was Nigel who was engineering and Mutt was producing and there was there was nobody else around. So I'm not sure he may have been there on the Pyromania sessions. And there were so many people I just, you know, forgotten. But I, I, ha I have no no anecdotes I can share with you. <laughs> no, nothing to share about Mike. All right. So uh, when you when you so you did women, you know, on Hysteria, uh, they are there is the bankrupt brothers. Right. Is that mm -hmm. so is that you the entire album? It's every song on the album except for Pour Some Sugar On Me. That was recorded, that was a real late addition to the album, which I think has been well documented. That was sort of like literally a couple of weeks before the album was finished, and I, I was long gone by then. So I'm not on that one, but there are um, some other songs on there, like Fractured Love, um, Ring of Fire, maybe a couple of others that, that I did sing on, which didn't end up on... Hysteria. I think uh, there's a couple of them on the retroactive album um, stuff. So yeah, yeah, they're they're on retroactive. Okay, so um, I just want to ask you a little bit about the sense of what was going on in the studio because, of course, Rick had the accident. Uh, it, it was four years in between albums. There, there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of money going into it. Did did you get a sense that they were just making an album and everything was okay? <laughs> Or was there a sense of urgency in the studio of like, oh boy, we better get this perfect because we might be done if we don't? I think there was certainly a realization that they'd spent so much money and it had been so long that, you know, this album basically needed to go gold as a minimum. Otherwise, yeah, they, they were stuffed because they, they'd spent so much money on it. But um, I don't think there wasn't a sense of urgency as regards time. Um, they were just determined to get it right. And of course, Mutt is not somebody who's going to be rushed because he's a perfectionist. And, uh, you know, unless he's happy with it and it's perfect, it's not going out. So, um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So let me let me get you back to, to Lionheart. You now have a Lee Small, who, of course, has been with a shy and phenomena. Uh, what does Lee bring to to Lionheart in terms of vocal prowess, in terms of just being a band member, just being a mate? 
Uh, what does he bring to the band? Um, all of the above, actually. He's, he's, I mean, he's a great guy for a start. And, and one thing that's really important to us as a band is to all be friends and, and get on together. Because, you know, we've, we've been doing this a long time. And the last thing we want to do is go on the road or go, or go in the studio, spend time with people we don't like. Because, you know, when, we're not... It's a struggle to make a living doing this now. So you have to be in it for the right reasons and that you just love playing the music and you like the guys you're spending time with. So number one, he's a great guy. Number two, he's got the most amazing voice. I mean, it's so soulful. It, you know, for me, growing up, Glenn Hughes is one of my favourite singers. And Lee just has has touches of that soulfulness that, that Glenn has. And uh, and to me, that that's fantastic. Plus, he's a great lyricist, a great songwriter. I mean, some of the, the, the lyrics on the on the new album, they're not your, you know, the I woke up this morning, my baby was gone type lyrics. They're, they're, they're really interesting subjects. You know? yeah. uh, you Th- know. Thankfully, <laughs> it's not it's not. Hey, baby, baby. But uh, yeah. I, I do want to ask about about moving the band forward because you, you have changed vocalists from Jess to Chad to uh, to Lee. You you know you, you you took a long break there in between. You come back with Second Nature. Classic Rock Magazine says, "Oh my God, AOR Album of the Year." Which, by the way, congratulations because that album was great. Um, do, do you see this as sort of a hobby that we're doing when Steve's not doing Shanker and so, or is it like, hey, you know what? We've actually got something here. Let's run it as a business and move it forward and do an album this year and an album in two years and in 2022. How do you sort of see it progressing? Is it is it just shits and giggles or is it like, oh, yeah, no, no, no. We're Lionheart and we're back. OK, um, the emotionally, we every single one of us is 100 percent invested in this. And this is what we want to do. This is our passion project and it means everything to us. The, the reality of the business and the situation is Lionheart doesn't generate enough money for us to live on. So we all have to do other projects. Um, you know, the, the, the Michael Schenker Fest pays the bills for Steve and that I'm playing with Sweet, which he and Lee both do at the moment. I have I have a family business that I run in the background. Um, you know, yeah, we we all love, and I also play with with Air Race, um, another um, band, um, and uh, you know, and House of X, and 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 Clive plays with about twelve different bands. He's constantly gigging. So, but we do whatever it takes to pay the bills. But as I say, emotionally, if we could devote a hundred percent of our time to it and and push it forward to the next level, so that it does generate an income that we can act, can actually sustain us, then we would all do it in a heartbeat. But, and that's what ideally we are working towards, but we have to be realistic and think in the current climate, how likely is that to happen? So, you know, we're kind of hedging our bets a bit. And and so uh, on that, uh, I'll, I'll say, you know what? I, I think the reality of Miracles is going to be one of these little underdog albums that I, I just want folks to discover and listen and, and give it a shot. Because if you like hard rock if you like Def Leppard if you like Kiss if you like Aerosmith if you like these bands uh this this one's for you folks right I mean it's it's, yeah. it's a great piece of work um yeah there we go there, I, I think I think we've got it all thank you sir you're very welcome <laughs> and uh, thank you for the for the Def Leppard uh the, the little Def Leppard uh, nuggets I, I in fact didn't know that you were on retroactive and I didn't even know that those songs you mentioned had been re- recorded during those. Well, actually, I did actually, because uh, uh, what, what was it? Ride into the sun. Right, I'm gonna ride. ride. That was actually a, a B side. Uh, so there you go. Yeah, that wasn't. Um, that that wasn't. I'm just trying to. Yeah, fractured love and ring of fire were definitely. Ring of fire. Done. Yeah, ri- yeah. Fractured love. Uh, I first saw, heard it on retroactive, but uh, ring of fire was a B side to. Uh, rocket or women or one of those and eventually uh, done okay but there you go so I, I got a little bonus news today for, for everybody <laughs> oh there you go uh, on that rocky thank you so much as we say in montreal uh, merci thank you yeah you're very welcome could you um w- when this can you send me a link to the the the, the youtube when of it course. comes out email it to me yeah um hold on a second let me, let me stop the recording